I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off, but I'm here in the background monitoring should we need anything. And Paul will be ready to play uh, Brian's video at the start after your introduction, Dave. So we live now, Paul? We are indeed. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is session five of our GBT at 20 years celebration. Um, this session will talk about um, our high frequency receivers on the telescope, and it's supposed to run from 2 to 3 p.m. Um, before we start in on the individual science talks, I was going to cover some PTCS performance, um, what we're the telescope currently does or can achieve. So the PTCS project, the pointy telescope and control system from the GBT was a project that um, Richard led starting way back in 2003. And the basic goal of this project was to improve the telescope after the commissioning to enable three millimeter observations. Um, and we've been successful. It's taken a while. And everybody listed here, everybody to the left was the original group on the PTCS project back in 2003, according to internal documentation that I looked up. And then over the years, since um, Richard had set up a system that documented things really well, I can figure out who did what <laughs> over time. And, and those are listing of other people who contributed as well over the years. Um, I should acknowledge Richard's leadership on that. And he kept um, this going for many, many years. And, and the fact that it, things were documented really helps out for us to um, make improvements on the system. So we mentioned the track upgrade. I'm not sure if people said when. That happened around 2007. And what's impressive is the track is amazingly flat. The blue measurements were actually here before the track upgrade. And the red measurement showed the flatness of the track after the upgrade. And on this, on this scale here, um, it's in arc seconds as it would be seen on the sky in terms of elevation pointing offsets. And um, six arc seconds corresponds to a millimeter. Um, so after the track upgrade, the flatness across that track was to a small fraction of a millimeter, which is quite impressive. We've also mentioned the improvements to the surface. Um, Todd did not give his presentation, but if he did, he probably would have talked about his, the work that he did with others in um, 2009, where they um, set, they fixed, they did traditional holography and they um, found the broken actuators. They fixed those, they reset the zero points for all the actuators. And if you go from left to right, you see from January to September, how much they cleaned up the dish, the corresponding beam pattern at 12, well, I guess that's the holography beam at um, 12 gigahertz is shown at the bottom. So this really cleaned up and improved the surface in 2009. And this was all done before I arrived. I actually arrived as coincidentally at the end of September of 2009. So I have to give kudos to everybody who came before me and made the GBT what it is. And I did this a few years ago when I just put a memo out. Well, I was doing the gain curve at Q band and I was curious on how things have changed over time. So I went back and looked at the different models and the different results. And this is sort of the history of, I think Jay might've shown this last night. I wasn't there when he did or showed some aspect of this, but this just shows the improvement of the dish effectively in terms of being able to do science over the years. 2003 with just the FEM model, the finite, element model correcting for gravity, this would be the effective Q-band efficiency, the dotted line, um, as a function of eleva elevation. It was best right here at the, what we call the rigging angle. And then when they in implemented the gravity Zernike model in 2009, that improved it and flattened it up here. Um, but it was still, that's 209, 2009A, 
it was still pretty low. When they fixed all the actuators and set their zero points, it popped that curve up here, which is really good, but we still had an elevation effect. Um, and then in 2014, um, Ron and I made a new gravity Zernike model. Actually, Ron did all the fitting. Thank you, Ron. Um, and we had some summer students involved and in, um, looking through the OOF data to build that up. Um, and, but then when we measured the gravity curve after that, uh, what the results were amazingly flat in comparison. So if you take the Q band results up here, let's look at my cursor. I don't hear my, uh, this is Q band, and you move it up to um, w band up at 80 gigahertz, that's what the curves would correspond to. And if you invert that, those measured aperture efficiencies into surface errors, this is what you would get. So over time, we've really improved uh, uh, the performance of the telescope. This is, I'm not going to go through all the details here. But this is a current estimated air budget for the GBT surface. We hit 190 microns roughly if you look at panel size errors. And then we have these techniques, oof. Uh, techniques as well as hopefully Lassie in the future to re remove the large scale errors. In principle, we might be able to get down to 200 microns. That's the goal long term. And besides just the surface errors, which we improved, if we so this table just I looked through the old documentation and I looked at certain metrics of GBT performance. What it was when we started this in 2003, the PTS, PTCS project, what we measure today, and, and here are some here are the values. So the surface starting value was um, 470 microns. We got it down to 230 microns. Um, offset nearby pointing used to be about three arc seconds. Now we're about one arc seconds. The servo upgrade, which I was talked about a little bit, Tim Whedon was involved with that as long as well as a lot of other people, really improved the tracking air of the telescope before it would be very hard to track within a high precision of a beam at three millimeters. We at the highest frequency of the GBT are beams six to seven arc seconds. So you need to be able to track and point to a fraction of an arc second in principle to maintain high efficiencies. Uh, but anyway, I'll just move on. So that's the performance of the telescope. Now I am going to end out and we're going to go ahead up and load up Brian's Mustang talk. So I'm going to let Paul do that. Paul, can you do that? I will get that done. And in the meantime, Todd is with us now, I think. Okay, so he can Todd, talk do you about have some that. remarks you'd like to give? That, that, that'd be a good time for him. Uh, sure, I could do that. I, I have a few slides. Um, uh, taken ahead. from one of my talks from back then. Um, so let me go ahead and share. If it's now is a good time. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'll display these. Okay. Are you, so are you seeing presentation mode now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, the, the full version of this talk, I, I have a link to it here, um, which you can get. Uh, but I just wanted to point out a few things. Um, my history with the GBT, um, before I came to NRIO, I worked on the SMA, submillimeter ray interferometer, um, working in Cambridge, Mass, and, and Mauna Kea, Hawaii. And I actually first met John Payne in, I think it was 2000, at an SMA review committee meeting, and we were uh, demonstrating motion of the first antenna with the new servo out at Haystack. And I was demoing him the handheld Palm Pilot control that I'd written. And he was quite <laughs> excited about that. And he was pressing all the buttons. I'm like, no, don't press them that quickly. Anyway, it all works. And uh, um, he was quite enthused. Um, and so when I, after SMA finished, uh, was co commissioned, um, I was looking towards Alma and I interviewed at NRAO for a science staff position. And John Payne, I, I gave a talk in Charlottesville and John Payne came to find me at Edgemont Road to say that GBT really needed somebody to oversee the surface improvements and really focus on it and get it done. And he was still thinking laser ranging. Um, I, I, at the time was thinking we have, you know, we have to do holography first and, you know, laser ranging might be good for fast, uh, 
tune-ups later, but we need to we need to do that first. So since Alma couldn't hire me for more than 10% of an effort, I spent most of my weekdays in Green Bank for the first three years um, trying to lead the PTCS effort. Um, of course, the first priority was recovering from that azimuth track, and uh, Joe Brandt implemented that new track map term that uh, Dave just showed that Kim Constant Tykes developed. And that was a challenge getting, being the intermediary between uh, Kim and everybody else on the PTCS, but that in the end was successful. Um, and then the second priority was to get uh, oophilography. I guess Boyan probably talked about that earlier to uh, make that uh, integrated into the Astrid and Melinda Mello and Pam Ford uh, really helped out on that. And, we got that pushed through. And that, that was the first time I'd ever used Python. Um, and I, I had never done Python, I'd never done wikis, and I never done video cons before I came to NRAO. And all of those things were part of, part of my life forevermore. Um, anyway, but my primary goal was to measure the surface at high resolution with satellite holography. And that really turned out to be a team effort of the whole staff, but Fred Schwab, was the person I worked most closely with and, and the key to its ultimate success. And if you want to read about it, it's in this paper. Um, so all, all the people here did stuff. Steve White got the receiver going again. Um, and John Ford wrote the manager for the, for the correlator back end. Uh, Frank helped with the, the uh, observing and we were looking for satellites. And Ron, of course, wrote the original memos about how to do it and what you need to do. And Brian did the, we did the follow up with Mustang to show how we were uh, improving the surface. And uh, JD and uh, Jason were out there fixing actuators every week after we found new ones that needed work. Um, of course, Richard Prestige was the director at the time. Um, and we talked about this whole strategy when I first got here and we put it into motion. Paul Reese was a student grad student I had that worked with the quadrant detector. Um, and actually understanding how the GBT uh, accelerometers and quadrant detector signal changed during holography scans convinced us that we weren't really gonna have any problem getting an accurate surface measurement. And uh, Bob Simon uh, worked on the feed, which I think was a 43 meter feed from the receiver reused and Shri uh, at CDL, helped me with the modeling of the in ZMAX and other code he had to show the, the diffraction effects that we'd expect. And Pete Whitus, I also worked on the software um, effort and was on the PTCS in general. Uh, so this was the first map we made. It was right after New Year's, January. This was the first large map, a high resolution map. and I, and. When Fred and I, Fred showed this to me, I'm like, wow, we, there's a hell of a lot of information in this map and we have a lot of work to do. But you can really start to see every, lots of different effects. You can see um, the sort of large scale, the red and it's sort of in the top and the blue in the bottom, that's a, you know, a large scale deformation, the kind of things you take out with oophilography. And you can remove that from the data and then start to look more at what's left and you can see these rings sort of out near the edge of the dish. And those are actually due to uh, diffraction at the subreflector. There's not that many wavelengths across the subreflector at uh, 11 gigahertz. So you would actually expect this to happen. And so you have to remove those because they're not actually telling you about the actuators. But the thing that really convinced us we knew it was working is this part of the dish. You can see down in the center to the left, that pattern really shows the, the actuator response function where the, the panels change from being two meters wide to one meter wide. And you can see that one actuator at the, at, at the joint is out by many millimeters and you see its effect bending the panels, all four of those panels. And you see other areas of dish where, where that's happening. So it was really just a matter of uh, effort at this point to um, iterate through. Uh, and so this was the iteration sequence. You obtain a holography map in, in good stable conditions, and then Fred would go off and process it and determine the new corrections. And at the time we found that we, 
we had to scale the corrections by a half and we didn't really understand why at the time, but we kept making improvements. So we kept doing it. And if, if we gave the full correction, it wouldn't be as good. Um, it turned out that we, I wasn't processing data quite right uh, for the amplitude part to, to, to recover the amplitude from the correlator. Um, and actually Daryl Emerson, when I asked Daryl Emerson about it, he pointed out the right way that how he was doing it on Alma and that once we Fred started doing that, it was much, we, we were able to do three quarters, I think, or we were able to do a higher fraction and, um, and things made more sense. And then we would confirm the improvement with Mustang. And because the active surface, you could say, give me the old surface, take a scan, give me the new surface, take a scan. And that rapid feedback during hours, you know, a few hour window of good weather really helped uh, confirm that we were making progress. And uh, Dave showed uh, this map just now. But I, the, the last thing I wanted to say, people might not appreciate this, but I wanted to tie it back to the design of the telescope. And so the beam pattern really is showing you this interesting uh, pattern that is emerging as you fix the actuator positions. You get this arc-like structure at the top and the bottom. And if you look, closely further out on the left and the right, there's a weaker pattern. And Fred and I were trying to understand that. And Fred, of course, knew that uh, the panels you see here, this is the back of a panel, have these ribs, and that's to uh, support uh, the surface of the, of the panel under gravity. And so, um, you know, it's not perfect. There's going to be a pattern. And you can see in the, the upper right shot, that's a, model of what how the panel sh should deform under gravity so you see the really fine rib structure but then at the corners of course it's it's supported and then it sags in the middle and if you look at that pattern in a model which fred put together that's what it looks like on the left and then that's what the holography map looks like and so you can see this consistent pattern and um the other uh, item that people may not know is that um, Fred was able to saw, save about a million dollars by um, reusing the same uh, panel shape for several successive hoops. And um, it, it, in the end, uh, it was we got the telescope we paid for, and that was to to the credit of a lot of people who pushed on the. Uh, the requirements and the specs and really looked into detail what, what would happen. And uh, just to show here's a, on the left is that observed beam now, and this is the predicted beam with the gravity error and then with a the thermal error term. And so it's really, it's, it's really, it's not exactly what you see, but it, it no, the major components are all understood of that beam. And just it's something here that people may not appreciate, uh, Clear skies are great for uh, opacity and uh, stability, and but they actually cause the the uh, panels to sag because more because the top of the panel is looking at the cold sky, the back of the panel is looking at the warm earth, and so you get a bigger deflection. And so actually, cloudy skies um, gives you would give you a better uh, surface efficiency. And just to tie back to the history of Green Bank, this is from an old memo by Sebastian von Horner. And this was back in the day when they were going to make the big, thinking about making a big telescope. And he did these measurements um, with a big panel uh, and with, a, I guess, with a micrometer caliper, the dial indicator. And he would measure the deflection of the panel with uh, temperature gradients. Um, and he noted, made this note of when it was sunny, it went one way and it was the temperature gradient and it was at nighttime, it went the other way. And so this is what, uh, we see today now with the, with the GBT, we took, uh, that, that, that good holography map from September 11th, 2009 was taken under clear sky. So you have the negative, uh, temperature gradient, and then it was a cloudy night, uh, I think the cloudy night was January 21st. And then during the day, there was one here for November 21st showing in the other direction. And so 
So I think the history of Green Bank was leading up to the GBT long before people realized it. And this is what the panel sag looks like. Uh, nighttime, cloudy, and then daytime. Uh, and just to echo something I think was talked about earlier, Tim had said that the panel corners were really set well. I, that was, I initially feared that we'd have to be out there setting all these corners again, but, but Tim quickly allayed that fear saying that no, they really did a good job at that. And it's true that I think there were only a couple of spots and these are the two plots I could find where it was obvious that a panel corners weren't right. Um, and so those were reset manually and those, uh, those, those errors went away. And so those must've just been, you know, the end of a long work day or something and it wasn't, wasn't set quite right. Um, so that was a, a key to make this whole system uh, to work correctly. And uh, I think I should probably stop there. You probably have other things you wanna talk about. I am really glad we did not miss this. Those yeah, illustrations are amazing. Jeremy Thorley has a question for you in the chat. He says, why not thermal shield the back of the panels or is it too small, it's not worth it? Well, that's an interesting uh, idea. The, the 30 meter telescope at ERAM actually did put, does have a shield behind and they run air through um, to try to keep the temperature more e equal. Um, that would have added expense, of course, to the GBT. Um, and I imagine that uh, the thermal, the, it was factored into probably the cost and it was realized that yes, there is a thermal issue, but it shouldn't be, the small scale part of it shouldn't be limiting the 230 micron RMS target. Of course, the 30 meter telescope wants to operate at much higher frequency. So they, they would need that sort of, they would benefit from that technology. Yeah, I mean, and just to add to thought, I think it's point here. I, I think the, I mean, the shield would be close to ambient as well anyway. <clears throat> so it wouldn't help that much. Really, it's the skin, which is super cooling, which is probably the bigger problem. Yeah, I suppose, that, and then the, that is certainly true. Um, you would have to then, I guess, uh, cool the, 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 that backing structure if you wanted to, to achieve the goal. Yeah, massive Peltier cooler would do, yeah. do the job. <laughs> so Todd, I've known about this for, you know, this effect for 30 years because I've read Van Horner's memos soon after I arrived, arrived at the observatory. So um, in anticipation that someone will take this idea over, there is a feature in the weather forecasting program, which actually derives the heat load on the front, on the you know, from the sky and from the ground. And so you can actually use that to uh, determine whether there's a temperature gradient um, across the panels. So in principle, you could say, well, you know, it's a nice clear night. The surface is gonna be pretty ruined because of it. We shouldn't be doing high frequency observing because of that. In principle, that stuff, that stuff to predict when to uh, do the uh, do high free when when this uh, uh, effect happens is um, already available to anybody who wants to play around with uh, this uh, phenomena. I'm looking at the chat now. Yes, we should make a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can just add. Uh, this is Brian. Uh, may, maybe by way of segue. Um, that these, you know, seeing all these results, uh, that, that really was just a very exciting time. We, we actually got first light with Mustang on the telescope at three millimeters in 2006. And we had sort of struggled along making a series of improvements and trying to do, you know, doing some early science, but it really was when um, this, this surface setting uh, took place due to the huge efforts of lots of people um, that, that it, things really took off. Yeah, and that's another uh, point uh, to stress that that remote observing was already uh, implemented then. And once we got holography system going, it was trivial to do it from Charlottesville. 
um, and that really made it easy to get 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 it scheduled in good conditions to be able to do it from there without having to come over. And the OOF capabilities are just amazing. They they still sometimes let me observe, and um, uh, I'm still always just I feel like I'm using a science fiction telescope when you get that map and you send the corrections and then the beam is better. So I, I think it's all just amazing. Yes, it was, and it is great. Um, and Brian, are you ready? We're gonna go ahead and get set up for your talk. Um, you wanted to do the recording? I think Paul's gonna stream, I'll be here. Okay. Yes, I've got them ready to stream, so I'll go ahead and share my screen, thank you. Thanks, Todd. Okay, I'll stop. Hi, today I'm going to be showing you some of the highlights of the broad range of three millimeter continuum science that the community has been doing with the GBT over the past decade or so. Most of what I'm going to be showing you originated from Mustang and Mustang 2, which are the two generations of bolometer cameras that the GBT has hosted. These are uh, broadband continuum cameras. They cover the range from about 80 to 100 gigahertz and they give a nine arc second resolution on the GBT. The current instrument on the telescope Mustang 2 has about a four arc minute field of view, an instantaneous field of view. And together these cameras have been in use for science since about 2008. They uh, have 300 millikelvin cryogenics, the, the detectors are kept at 300 millikelvin, which uh, I think means they are probably the coldest thing that's ever been in Pocahontas County. Both instruments were developed in collaboration with Mark Devlin's group at the University of Pennsylvania and had uh, contributions from many other individuals and institutions, including NIST uh, and uh, NASA. To give you an idea of the range of science that Mustang, um, that, well, that three millimeter cameras on the GBT can address, uh, Green Bank postdoc Charles Romero has put together this overview of Mustang II proposals by science category in the past couple of years. The, um, you can see there's a good uh, healthy interest from the star formation community and some interest in uh, planetary science. We have a couple of AGN projects and we have a huge demand from uh, the galaxy cluster community. And I've just put up here this, um, this quote from the original GBT proposal in 1989 highlighting uh, the perfect match that high angular resolution, uh, since high angular resolution SZ measurements are to the GBT. This is actually called out a couple of times in the original proposal and is uh, really prescient. To anchor this capability in the context of uh, studies of our galaxy and nearby galaxies, uh, I'm, I've shown here the sort of canonical spectral energy distribution of a normal galaxy, in this case M82 from Jim Condon's review article. Uh, Mustang and Mustang 2 live right here and uh, sort of in this trough between uh, non-thermal and uh, thermal, between synchrotron emission and thermal dust emission. What this means is that we often get a fairly clean view of free-free emission in galaxies. We're also sensitive to thermal dust uh, we have a good long, long lever arm, spectrally speaking, uh, to constrain the uh, dust emissivity and, and the, the, the spectrum of dust, and excellent synergy with instruments at both ends of the spectrum. One of my personal favorite surprise results from Mustang emerged from this idea that Scott Schnee had uh, about a decade ago, which was to map the uh, map the integral shaped filament using the uh, old original Mustang. What we found when we did that, and I should I should pause and explain for those of you um, uh, who who need reminding, the integral shaped filament is a um, very dense region, uh, very dense filamentary region of star formation in the Orion molecular cloud. The Mustang map we got is shown on the right here in orange. Um, uh, superposed on optical data. 
what we found when we did this was actually that the three millimeter dust emission was surprisingly bright. And subsequent investigations have shown that this has the character of a fairly distinct break in the spectrum of the thermal dust emission, which continues even as far out as one centimeter. That's something that was recently established also with GBT um, continuum measurements. This has implications for dust models and potentially for inferences that uh, are to be made from one centimeter and three millimeter range, sort of long millimeter, short centimeter range, uh, continuum measurements, particularly to the extent that this sort of uh, anomaly continues down to small scales where a lot of um, measurements are done. This is not a, a GBT result, but uh, the work, our work and others work with the GBT pointed the way for this, um, for this study. The, this is a, a broader study using data from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope using uh, covering the range from 90 gigahertz to about 220 gigahertz together with Herschel data. Um, I've shown the ACT data to the right here. And this is work that's being led by Ian Lowe at the University of Pennsylvania that um, ho hopefully will be submitted for uh, publication soon. And what he's done is he's looked at um, five other dense star forming filaments in our galaxies covering a total of about eight square degrees in this case. Excuse me. And the preliminary result is that we see similar things going on. There's also a proposal to follow up a few uh, few regions, a uh, few, few subsets of these regions with Mustang 2 that have ALMA coverage to tie together the largest scales measured by Herschel and ACT all the way down to the individual protostar scale that is well resolved by ALMA. Mustang 2 um, has been and is in the process of studying star formation also in nearby galaxies. Uh, I've shown here uh, a Mustang 2 map of NGC 6946 superposed on 24 micron data. This is a map from an ongoing um, study in the Star Formation Radio Survey, SFRS, which is a multi-facility campaign led by Eric Murphy. Uh, and we have 18 galaxies and counting covered with GBT. What we see um, in our current analysis is that uh, the emission at 3.3 millimeters is mostly dominated by free free, but with some significant scatter. So there are definitely some sources that appear to be dust dominated even as far out as 3.3 millimeters. Um, and that's that's really um, what what is what we're aiming to do with SFRS is to understand the relationship between um, radio surface brightness and high mass star formation on a per region sort of resolved basis. And this is work that has been recently led by Abigail Harden and NRAO RU last summer, who uh, we're very happy will be joining us uh, at, at UVA as an incoming grad student this, this coming year. One other uh, quick highlight about this target, it actually contains the first known site of extragalactic anomalous microwave emission. This was discovered by Eric Murphy using the GBT at one centimeter. One distinctive capability of large focal plane arrays on single dishes is that they're really good at mapping big areas. So uh, what I've shown here is a set of maps from a galactic plane survey that Adam Ginsberg has been leaving, uh, leading. Uh, this survey so far has covered just under eight square degrees with Milijansky sensitivity and about a 10 arc second resolution. These maps were acquired in uh, about 18 hours total of GBT time. And the maps themselves are available at this link here. What Adam was able to determine from this, uh, he was able to uh, discover 10 candidate hypercompact H2 regions that have no previous centimeter wave detections. These are thought to be the very earliest stage uh, in the evolutionary sequence of uh, massive stars. And by comparing the counts of these hypercompact H2 regions, uh, with uh, known counts of ultracompact H2 regions uh, produce an estimate of the relative durations of these phases in the evolutionary sequence of massive stars. Uh, 
So that's all discussed in uh, this paper, which was published just last year, al along with uh, much else. So I'm going to shift gears now and talk about galaxy clusters and the Sinyaev Zildovich effect. Most of you uh, are probably familiar with galaxy clusters. They are systems of roughly, you know, sort of hundreds of galaxies which live in a deep potential well dominated by dark matter. Most of the um, most of the baryons in these in galaxy clusters doesn't actually live in the galaxies. Uh, but actually in the form of a hot plasma in between the galaxies and co-spatial with the dark matter potential well. So a lot of what we've learned about galaxy clusters has come about by studying um, the, 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 the emission uh, and characteristics of this intercluster medium, this, this hot plasma. Uh, the sinyayev zeldovich effect is a distortion in the microwave background caused by um, caused when microwave background photons travel through this hot plasma at short wavelengths, wavelengths shorter than about 1.4 millimeters. It appears as a decrement. In other words, it appears as uh, a negative signal on the sky if you don't measure absolute true zero. Um, and the surface of brightness of that decrement is proportional to the integrated thermal electron pressure. Uh, it provides a really great robust physical diagnostic image essentially of the intercluster medium. One uh, really cool feature of the sinyaev zeldovich effect is that it's independent of redshift. So if you take the same system and, and move it out and redshift, the surface brightness of the um, SZ doesn't change, which enables you to study high redshift systems really well. Um, and it's really sensitive to hot gas. The other mainstay uh, in the past few decades to study the ICM uh, is by means of its X-ray emission. It emits by X-ray Bremsstrahlung, which is a density density process. Density squared. Sorry, it's a particle particle process. It's a density squared uh, emission mechanism. That means the X-rays give you really ex a really excellent view of density variations, but they're not as good in um, the outer regions of galaxy clusters, and they also um, suffer from cosmological dimming. So clusters at high redshift are quite hard to study um, with X-rays. What uh, Mustang II in particular on the GBT has enabled is routine nine arc second resolution SZ imaging. And I think this is just incredible. I did my thesis on SZ measurements and we would observe for a very long time and work very hard to get a seven arc minute measurement of the SZ effect um, but now we do this all the time in just, just a few hours. So th this is a set of images of mad cows clusters, clusters from the mad cows sample. This is a paper written by Simon Dicker. Um, in fact, we have over 30 high quality sensitive uh, images of the SC effect from Mustang 2 and Mustang. These target a range of samples, uh, including weak lensing clusters, Hubble frontier clusters, and a good sampling of uh, individually interesting targets, be the high redshift merging or otherwise. Um, the science that we do with these images is to measure the pressure profiles of the clusters to assess their dynamical states uh, and to look for shocks and other difficult to study features in the intercluster medium. A great example is this Mustang 2 image of the SC effect in the famous cluster MS0735 plus 7421. Um, if you look at the right-hand image, you'll see why this cluster is famous. Uh, the blue shows the X-rays and the red shows radio emission from the VLA. Um, and what you see happening here is that the outflow from the central AGN in this cluster has carved holes in the X-ray emission. And the question is, what does this outflow, uh, outflowing material consist of? And if you look at the left-hand image, the uh, fact that the SZ decrement tracks very closely the X-rays indicates that the SZ decrement is also suppressed in these uh, so-called holes or, or cavities. Uh, what that in turn Im implies is that the jet does not primarily consist of very hot thermal electrons. 
Um, another, another couple of examples uh, on the top right, this is uh, one of the mad cows clusters, and we see a, a very significant offset between the optical galaxy centroid and where the peak SZ effect is, that's over a uh, two arc minute offset. The uh, optical galaxy centroid and the, beast, the brightest cluster galaxy correspond quite well. Um, so this indicates a very disturbed system. Uh, and these are a couple other examples of merging clusters in the middle, one at uh, redshift just over, uh, just over unity. Uh, and on the left, a weak lensing cluster. Both of these have evidence of uh, highly shock heated gas due to the interaction between these clusters. In the case of the uh, weak lensing cluster, this gas has been measured to be in combination with X-ray data between 20 and 30 keV, which is really, really hot. And lastly, uh, this is a project led by Stefano Andrian studying a very high redshift cluster. This is a cluster at a redshift of 1.75. The Mustang image is shown uh, in the center here. This was from about uh, an X-ray unit's 18 kiloseconds on source. And the Chandra image of this source is on the right from 100 kiloseconds of Chandra time. And by combining the Mustang 2 and Chandra data, we're able to measure the density profile, the temperature, and the pressure profile. What we see in this, uh, in this instance is that the pressure profile uh, at large radius, greater than about 400 kiloparsecs, is considerably flatter than the so-called universal pressure profile. And it suggests non-thermal pressure support may be significant in the outskirts by, for example, bulk motions and turbulence. Uh, and this is really interesting. This, this cluster uh, has a mass of about 2.5 times 10 to the 14. Uh, and and uh, given the expected growth of structures over cosmic time, it is the predecessor, it is, it is the likely predecessor of a really massive cluster today, sort of 10 to the 15 solar mass cluster. So in summary, multi-pixel continuum cameras on the GBT provide a really flexible and powerful capability to address a wide range of science topics. These include uh, high angular resolution SZ effect measurements, star formation, galac both galactic and extragalactic, dust physics, and I didn't have time to talk about this, but even lunar physics I have shown on the top right here, a Mustang 2 map of the moon, uh, along with an optical image taken on the same night. This is from a proposal led by Paul Hain that we observed uh, uh, back in 2019. Uh, and you can look at those for a long time and see a lot of really cool stuff. I'd like to leave you with uh, just this personal thought, which is I, I think these capabilities and the flexibility of the GBT will remain um, really powerful well into the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I'll check in and let's see. Oh, there is something in the QAA. Um, Marion had a question for you, Brian. I don't know if you. Sure. Yeah, I see that. Okay. So the, the question is, uh, could uh, what, what is the difference between Mustang and Mustang 2? Um, there are a number of differences. The, the key differences are um, the pixel architecture. Uh, how, how radiation is absorbed and how radiation is coupled. So in particular, Mustang 2 is a feed horn coupled array, whereas Mustang 1 actually uses re-imaging optics to make a, um, uh, I was gonna pull up a picture, I don't know if I can easily do that, to, to form an image directly on these very large, fairly floppy pixels themselves. Um, so the, the feed horn coupling has been really, uh, tremendously helpful to our sensitivity and also to adopting a pixel architecture, which is intrinsically more sensitive. That, that's the main difference. Uh, the other difference is that Mustang 2 has 223 feed horns, 215 uh, actual pixels. Um, so it, it's much larger com compared to 64 pixels in the original uh, camera. Okay, great. Um... I was looking at the chat and a lot of that is PTCS related um, um, conversations going on in the background. So we'll go ahead and move on to Rachel. If Rachel is ready, Rachel Friesen from the University of Toronto. We'll be talking about the KFPA. Uh, Dave, we do have another question that just came in. 
Oh, did it? Oh, sorry. In their Q and A. <laughs> Q and A. Okay, Brian, are you still there? There's a question. Sure. Uh, the question is: Have we done any hourly time scale variability? And um, I'm trying to make sure this is true. I'm pretty sure we have not with Mustang. It would be challenging, but if the variations were, you know, if you if you weren't looking for 10% level variations, I think you could certainly do that without too much trouble. Okay, thank you. Okay, Rachel, um, you already have it up. You can take it away. Awesome, thank you, uh, everyone. Um, really nice to see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, hopefully, um, you know, we can see each other in person at some point in the future. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the K-Band Focal Plane Array, um, and uh, this has really been a big part of my research, uh, the GBT and the KFPA. Uh, I spent a lot of time working uh, with the GBT as a PhD student, and then, of course, continuing on afterwards. Uh, and so I'm going to highlight work from um, multiple students, I think, who have uh, you know, been working on or gained uh, degrees uh, in part via KFPA data. So it's, it's really been a wonderful instrument, a wonderful telescope um, for, for students. Uh, so my talk's going to focus on my area of research, which is star formation within our own galaxy. So stars form uh, in molecular clouds in regions where dense gas is collected via some mechanism and where the force of gravity then dominates in order for the gas to collapse and actually form stars. Uh, so this is a three color image from the Herschel uh, telescope highlighting um, the emission from cold dust in the Perseus uh, molecular cloud. And it shows how these dense uh, star forming gas, which is highlighted by some of the clusters there, the well-known NGC 1333, small stellar clusters and some other regions that are actively forming stars in Perseus, um, is really embedded. You have this dense gas, but it's embedded within lower density structures and filaments. Um, and I'm highlighting this just because around the time that the KFPA actually became available, we really started seeing these large scale surveys from Herschel, uh, from the JCMT telescope, looking at the continuum emission from dust and having these wide maps of the continuum uh, showing us the structure of these clouds. And, and the KFPA really was instrumental or is instrumental in filling in the missing information on what is, what is the gas actually doing um, in these regions. Um, and so some of the highlights of these submillimeter continuum surveys really showed that the dense cores, those are the kind of the seeds of forming a single star or a, a young you know, binary or, or triple system. Um, and embedded protostars are often found within uh, filamentary structures. And not only that, but they're found within uh, filaments that are supercritical. Um, and that means that the mass per unit length of the filament is actually greater than what you would expect could be supported um, against its own self-gravity by just the thermal motions of the gas within that filament. Um, sometimes, uh, in some studies, cores outside of filaments appear less likely to appear bound, so you're more likely to get um, you know, cores that are gravitationally bound and, and perhaps collapsing within these supercritical filaments. Um, and the other thing too is that these, um, in, in, in more um, dynamic, more massive regions, stellar clusters tend to be found in the intersections of filaments. Um, and so this wasn't a new result from, from Herschel. Uh, there have been multiple papers ahead of uh, Herschel's um, surveys that, you know, kind of highlighted this kind of like hub filament structure of some uh, clustered star forming regions, but uh, really illustrated, you know, the ubiquity of these filamentary structures um, and really kind of um, made us very curious about whether or not the filaments themselves are really driving uh, the star formation and really having a big role in how the gas is collecting and then forming stars. So there's a lot of open questions, I think, that are still, um, you know, to be answered in terms of um, clouds and cores and how star formation actually occurs. Um, in our galaxy. And, and some of those questions are on what scales are clouds stable against gravitational collapse? You know, we have these filaments that appear, um, you know, gravitationally unstable when you consider only the thermal motions of the gas, but what happens when you actually investigate um, the, the, the turbulent motions that we know are there? Um, and that can't be probed by the, the continuum emission. Um, does the cloud environment influence the evolution of molecular gas and the resulting star formation? how, whether or not, and how dense filaments actually do channel gas flow and infall and accretion onto cores uh, within these filaments. And how does dust turbulence dissipate, you know, as you go from turbulent large scale structures down to uh, the very quiescent cores that we, we see uh, when we look at um, kind of the precursors for young stars. And so we really need gas kinematic surveys to answer these questions. 
And, and, and again, that, again, that's where the KFP really came in. Um, so I'm not going to get into too much of the, the technical side. Um, I wasn't privy to, you know, the uh, detailed development of the KFPA. I have been a very happy uh, user of the technology. Um, but basically, you know, the K, K band, the KFBA went from a single pixel to, to seven pixels. And that, you know, that's, that dramatically increased our ability to survey line emission at, um, you know, 23 gigahertz or in the K band roughly uh, in star forming clouds. And uh, for studies of star formation, this really allowed us to move beyond small maps of individual cores. Uh, so looking at, you know, single cores that will form a star or a pair of stars. Um, to, um, you know, mapping larger areas and really kind of understanding the connection between the cores um, and their environment. So uh, previous studies targeted individual cores uh, and some larger areas. This is work um, from my thesis where I used the original, um, you know, single pixel uh, K-band receiver. Um, and then moving on to, uh, this is a map of uh, Orion, including the integral shape filament that uh, Brian showed earlier. Uh, where we were able to make a much, much larger uh, map using the K-band focal plane array in a reasonable amount of time. So you can see the uh, filamentary structure. There's lots of lots of small scale structure within that filament. And you can highlight, I've highlighted here the 32 arc second beam just to show you just how well uh, we can we can really detect the, the dense gas structure here. And I should note that this is in ammonia. Um, and ammonia is a an, an really great molecule. It has transitions at 23 gigahertz in the K-band. Um, and the, the inversion transitions of ammonia, which we can detect at this, at this wavelength, um, are, are coupled by collisions. And so, you know, it's well matched to um, the densities of these star forming regions. It's excited somewhere around 10 to the four particles per cubic centimeter. Um, but because the, the multiple inversion transitions are close together in frequency and they're excited by collisions, uh, we can use this to get an independent measure of the gas um, kinetic temperature as well as the, uh, the motions of the gas. Um, so this was uh, some early results that I think really uh, kind of highlighted the promise of the KFPA. And this is a map of Taurus, a uh, region in Taurus by Yang Min Sao, who uh, was a graduate student at the time and is now a scientist at JPL. And so what you see here um, is the submillimeter dust continuum emission um, from uh, on the top panel highlighting where you can see in the bright regions are places where you have stars forming in these dense cores. Um, and then Young Min also mapped uh, a beautiful uh, filament um, in ammonia emission. And so the bottom panel is showing you that integrated ammonia intensity. Um, and that really picks out those, those dense cores and dense structures um, as you know, we expect based on our knowledge of what uh, ammonia does. Um, and so, um, I'd also wanted to just highlight here also that, you know, one of the really nice things about the GBT and the KFPA in particular is that, you know, it really, um, it really just worked. Um, and there was a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of work behind the scenes, a lot of uh, work by the GBT staff in particular for the KFPA was Glenn Langston and Joe Masters, who were instrumental in, in you know, getting the observing going and uh, coming up with um, good pipelines to actually put the data together. Um, so, you know, it was just really, um, always been really nice to work with. So like I said, we need these mapping surveys and ammonia is a really excellent tool um, that's well matched to um, you know, what we're trying to observe in terms of these dense cores. Um, and uh, there's also multiple other interesting transitions uh, of uh, different molecular species that are all clustered together. So it's uh, not just ammonia, although that's what I talk about most in some of these works or some of these presentations, but uh, you also can observe uh, water masers uh, in high mass surveys and, um, and, and other tracers of you know, different kinds of um, chemical history of the gas. Um, and so, uh, I was, uh, in, I am involved in the Green Bank Ammonia Survey, which is targeting uh, the nearby clouds in the Gould Belt uh, region. So all the, basically the active star forming regions within 500 parsecs. Um, and then there's been a number of other um, ammonia and other molecule species uh, tracers uh, surveys uh, that are targeting higher mass uh, regions and uh, more distant regions like the, uh, the, the galactic plains. So there's the, K, uh, the Keystone Survey uh, ramps and uh, an RMS survey that was targeting massive YSOs. So with, with these different surveys uh, enabled by the KFBA, we're targeting you know, kind of the, the whole range of local star formation, which is primarily low mass out to uh, several kiloparsecs, looking at high mass star forming regions, and then the galactic plane. 
Um, within my own uh, survey team, I also want to highlight, like I said, a number of young, uh, of a number of students have um, been involved in the survey, including undergraduates um, who are all involved in the gas papers. And then in bold, I've highlighted those students who have gone on to actually uh, complete their PhDs, including um, data from the KFPA and gas. So the, the hands-on experience that all the students get is, is a real benefit. Um, so uh, let's get back to some of the um, different regions and I'd like to show some of the gas results. Um, so this again is, is the Perseus West region. Um, and so highlighting those different um, star forming groups and in the right hand side is showing you the uh, H2 column density uh, determined from the Herschel data. And then in the white boxes are the mapped regions uh, from the KFPA. And then the contours, I'm sorry, the contours look a little small. I was trying to show a big region, but uh, show you where the, the, the strong ammonia emission is highlighting. So it's really picking up um, the uh, kind of the, the highest column density regions where uh, star formation is most likely to happen. Um, the distances in the Gould Belt clouds between 130 to about 450 parsecs uh, gives us a really high spa spatial resolution of about 0.02 to 0.07 parsecs. So that really resolves uh, cores, which are something like 0.1 parsec, um, all the way out to Orion. So it's really like uh, I think was mentioned yesterday, it's really well matched. Uh, the GBT beam and, and these cores really well matched to uh, the science that we're trying to do. Uh, this is looking at Ophiuchus, um, L1688 and L1689. So on the left again is a uh, Herschel three color image and then the yellow box is uh, highlighting the region um, that's been mapped um, in, in, uh, in Ophiuchus with gas. Um, and then this is another region I think that um, uh, is, is a little new. This is uh, W40, which is actually a, um, an H2 region with a young massive cluster of stars in the center. So you can see, uh, again, this is another uh, multicolor image from uh, ESA and Spire, um, highlighting the, the bubble that's being blown around this um, uh, H2 region. And then on the right-hand side is the active star from region Serpent South, which is one of the youngest known uh, cluster forming regions. Um, that was discovered primarily through infrared observations. Um, so if we take this three color image and then show what the H2 column density uh, image is, is uh, on the background and then uh, that's the, the orange scale colors and then the white box again is showing you the map we were able to do. Uh, this is combining gas, the survey data plus some previous uh, KF, KFPA data from uh, my own work um, to create this uh, larger mosaic. Um, and so you can really see again that uh, we're seeing the strong ammonia emission really highlighting all the, the filamentary and dense structures in this region. And like I said, the important thing from gas is that, you know, from the ammonia emission from KFPA is that you're getting the kinematics, you're getting the information on what the gas is actually doing. And so on the right hand side, and the grayscale now is the um, the column density uh, of H2. And then overlaid, I've shown you the, the velocity, the line of sight velocity measured from the ammonia emission. Um, so what you can see is that there's actually a very small um, change in the velocity across this entire region, smaller than what you would see in something like Orion. Um, but, uh, and, and that's interesting because there's always been this, uh, there's been an argument about how, whether or not W40 and Serpent South are actually interacting. Um, and you can see that there's some, there does seem to be some interplay in some of the gas features there in terms of the kinematics. Um, and then of course, we can also investigate the temperatures to understand how W40 might actually be uh, influencing star formation in Serpent South. So um, just uh, in the last few minutes, I wanted to highlight a couple uh, other highlights of the science from, from some of these surveys. Uh, we've really been focusing on the stability of cores and filaments. So what we've been finding is that if you factor in the, um, the, the gas motions in the cores that uh, most, most of the cores in nearby clouds actually aren't necessarily gravitationally bound by themselves, but they are bound by the external pressure around the cores. Um, and uh, reaching out to larger scales in the Keystone survey, so looking at um, the uh, kind of more massive, more distant regions, there is a tendency for larger structures to um, appear uh, more bound via a virial, a virial analysis. So that's the um, plot on the right is showing you the virial parameter, looking at the balance between the uh, kinetic energy and the gravitational potential energy. Um, and to be bound, you'd wanna be kind of below this line here. And so you see this trend where the smaller structures 
uh, appear to be um, uh, unbound, at least without factoring in the external pressure. Um, and larger structures actually appear to be, um, you know, quite uh, have very, very low virial parameters. Um, and so this has been, this kind of plot has been used to argue that you must have fairly strong magnetic fields in order to, to support these structures against gravity. Um, but some of the work that's um, being done by a student at University of Toronto, Aishi Singh, is showing that once you actually factor in some of the, the bulk motions of the gas in the kinetic energy term, uh, that can bring most of these structures closer to um, a virial parameter of one as you um, would expect. Um, and um, one of the other things that's really come out of this, these surveys is that um, we have really, really a beautiful and sensitive data. And uh, with that, we can really investigate that transition from the kind of more turbulent cloud into the uh, more quiescent filaments and cores and investigate the, the kinematics of that transition. And it's really pushed um, a number of students and postdocs to develop um, you know, sophisticated algorithms to try and disentangle places where we can see that there's multiple velocity components along the line of sight. So really taking advantage of that, um, that third component. So not just seeing you know, the plane of the sky emission, but really pulling out um, another uh, parameter that we can use to separate structures. Um, and so I really encourage you to take a look at some of these papers if you're interested. Um, a lot of these techniques are being developed to work on ammonia data, but of course they work on um, other spectral line analyses. Um, and of course, as was mentioned uh, earlier today, there's a lot of chemistry going on. So I've talked a lot about ammonia, but um, when we use the KFPA with the Vegas backend, we get a lot of flexibility in terms of being able to um, identify uh, extra lines. Um, so I'm just gonna be one more minute. I know we're heading over to the, uh, the time, sorry. Um, but anyway, in, in uh, TMC1, which is a target of the, the Gotham survey, um, we detect really beautiful ammonia and HC5N emission. And when we do that, uh, we can see that the HC5N actually has, uh, appears to have multiple components to it, which are reminiscent of perhaps um, fibers, so smaller scale structures within the filament itself, uh, or also the kinematics are suggestive of, of uh, kind of revealing accretion and, and kind of how this filament may be forming. Um, so where is the future going? Um, so, you know, part of the, the, with these surveys, we're really trying to push, um, you know, putting this data out for everyone to use. And uh, so look for the, the gas uh, full data release, which is uh, hopefully coming out soon, where we'll have cubes and moment maps for all the observed regions. Um, I know Keystone's data is already public as well. Um, so these are really rich data sets for targeting higher resolution uh, with, via VLA and ALMA. Or, uh, or even uh, higher density, higher resolution tracers via Argus. Um, and so hopefully we'll hear more about that as well. Um, and so this is just quickly summarizing. Um, these large uh, multi-dimensional surveys are needed to test uh, dynamic star formation. Um, the KFBA has enabled multiple surveys of the kinematics of dense gas uh, across you know, nearby to distant uh, regions across the galaxy. And it's really developing, you know, uh, new analysis techniques um, and uh, driving student theses and tracking transitions um, across different regimes um, in molecular clouds. And uh, I will leave it there. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll stop now. <laughs> thank you, Rachel. They're very beautiful pictures. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure if you can pull up your Q&A. There is a Q&A from, and it's an anonymous attendee. I see that. Um, uh, you want me yeah, to read so it or can you read that, see that? that. Yeah, so uh, why did you include the HC5N and HC7N lines in your survey? Uh, do you detect compact or extended HC7N emission in your survey? So, um, you know, partly we did it because we could. Um, you know, when you have flexibility and, uh, uh, you know, you, you just, you know, add spectral lines just to see what's there. Uh, we did have, uh, you know, TMC1, we knew that there was HC5N in these long carbon chains in that region. Um, and so it made sense to try and ex examine whether this was something that's um, common across um, multiple clouds. Um, and interestingly, what we find is that, you know, we see a lot of these carbon chains in Taurus, not just TMC1, but in our other Taurus pointings, um, and also in Serpent South. But um, in other regions, we see maybe more compact HC5N uh, and CCS, but not the extended emission that we see in, in Taurus and Serpent South. So it's actually really interesting uh, from a chemistry side. Okay, thank you.
Um, and does anybody else have any other questions before we move on? We are running a little long on this session, but I will go fast on the last presentation. Um, the talk in the chat's been mostly about, we're still talking about OOF parameters and Zernikes, so. <laughs> Dave, don't worry if we go over some because we added a Todd in this time because we couldn't fit him in last time. So we'll just take a slightly shorter break. Okay. Let's see here. I'm going to hit my share screen. I'll see if I can actually do that. Oh, that actually worked. That's amazing. I'm learning more about Zoom. Um, okay. I, I am going to go over Argus three millimeter three millimeter uh, spectroscopy. So uh, Mustang works for continuum. If you wanna do mapping at three millimeters and do spectroscopy, use Argus. Uh, oops, see if I get, there we go. Anyway, Argus was um, built at, it was assembled in Green Bank in 2016 uh, by a PhD student, Matt Seath. Um, from Stanford. Um, the project was led by Stanford. It has a, a large uh, JPL component for the modules. Um, the University of Maryland, Andy Harris, um, who um, built the, uh, the warm electronics and the control systems. And then Josh Gunderson from the University of Miami did built the cryostat as well as the observatory itself. Um, and so it's a single solar, uh, single linear polarization. It's a 16 element feed order array that operates from around 75 gigahertz up to 115 gigahertz. So, so this is the traditional um, three millimeter band that is used for astronomy and it, and it has all the bright traditional three millimeter lines that people tend to observe. Um, so Matt put it together and tested it in the lab. Um, Mike Stennis, we should acknowledge him, um, he's no longer with us, but he helped Matt a lot, and he may help make this project work, as well as Mike helping Matt. He also helped me a lot when we got the um, instrument installed on the telescope to get things working. We commissioned it in 2016, and it worked really well. Uh, these images here, um, the one up here is just 13 CO. This is the actual first light with the instrument. We didn't have a calibration system and we only had a fraction of the array, but the CO lines, when you look at Orion, they're really bright. And this is on a log scale. So that was first light. Then just to show that we could do 12 CO, this was second light um, a few, a, a week or so later. And then this is a first map off here to the right. And that was the first time we had all 16 um, of channels of Argus connected up and the beam for comparisons right here. And this was taken very quickly. And this has been shown before, but um, there's a memo that I wrote up. I used some of Amanda Kepley's data from the night before when I came into work and I realized, gosh, that the sky was really good last night. And, and I looked in using Ron's um, data weather forecasting thing. And there was only about 1.5 millimeters of water vapor that night where these data were taken. And so I said, well, this is really, this almost ideal condition. So I looked at Amanda's data and the, and the beam that we achieved in that night was quite remarkable. And that's why I wrote up this memo. And it just showed that we can achieve theoretical beams of Argus if you scaled the um, whatever beam at nine gigahertz up to 110 gigahertz, we got exactly what you would expect to get. And although the weather was almost perfect that night, I mean, 1.5 millimeters of water vapor <laughs> beats AMA a lot of times or the harmonic A. Um, we, we achieve similar beams in, in higher opacity. The opacity doesn't affect the beams too much. Uh, and from the Argus observations, we've taken lots of data now. We've had several se seasons and I've put the calibration data together in, in addition with the W band data, which is a four millimeter receiver, which works really well. It has um, high performance at the uh, down to all the way down to 65 gigahertz. Um, but anyway, when we put all that data together, we found the telescope does work pretty well all the way at the highest end of the band. Um, everything's sort of um, consistent with sort of expectations and um, with a beam parameter of 1.2 and a, a ratio between the point source main beam efficiency and the aperture efficiency of 
um, when you observe a brighter source on the sky, <laughs> I mean, a bigger source on the sky, you measure a larger beam efficiency. So when people are doing extended source science with Argus, um, a lot of the sources actually, when, um, now with, I mean, with a six, seven arc second beam or, or well resolved by Argus. Um, so then you use a larger um, beam efficiency for, for larger sources. And this is um, for Jupiter in comparison to the point source quasars. And I'll just leave this table in here. I would, but the thing I, I wanted uh, for documentation uh, point out is it, the GBT is quite remarkable in the sense that when you go through all the calculations and measurements, about 95% of the total power is within one degree of the pointed direction on the sky, because we have a very um, low rear spillover efficiency and the forward spillover efficiency is also quite high. You multiply those two numbers together down at the bottom and you get nearly 95%. That's truly remarkable. So a little bit on um, Argus science. Um, currently, there are two large Argus science programs, DEGAS, um, which Amanda was fortunate enough, she talked about that um, this, um, this morning, and um, DISCO gas, which Rachel just mentioned. Um, DEGAS is an extragalactic project that measure dense gas in nearby galaxies. Uh, they're observing, right now they have like 17 galaxies for which we have data. We hope to expand it up to 36 at some point. But with two settings, we use the HCN and HCO plus with Vegas combination, make the maps of the galaxies. And then we have a higher frequency setting. I should say the HCN and HCO plus is down at 90 gigahertz where 13 CO and C18O is up near 110 gigahertz. So we do two maps of the galaxy, make multiple repeats to get down to good signal and noise um, to study just basically the dense gas, the molecular gas associated with the star formation within the inner cores of nearby galaxies. They have a lot of ancillary data. Um, these are famous nearby galaxies. And the picture here just shows an early picture. It's actually 12 CO of IC342, which is, is a nearby galaxy and shows some of the spiral structures and you get the higher resolution data with the GBT over what we've, um, you could obtain previously. The disco gas dynamics on um, star forming cores using the GBT. Um, you can do this with ammonia too, but what they're doing, they're pushing it to higher resolution and using a dense gas tracer called into H plus, which is at 93 gigahertz. This is a really nice molecule. Everybody that comes here and does into H plus with the GBT who has um, 30 meter data or previous lower resolution data is pleasantly surprised because into H plus pops out on the GBT because it's a denser gas tracer it's more clumpy gas. So typically their expectations of T main beam, if you go to 30 meter to come here, it's actually brighter than expected. So they're pleasantly surprised um, in comparison to sometimes with the CO where a CO isn't, isn't, isn't as clumpy. And if when you observe that, they're hoping to see a lot of substructure and they just see a big fluffy blob sometimes in CO. So it's, it's interesting working with the different star forming people from the groups with the, seeing their expectations with, for the GBT and what in reality when they collect their data and helping them to understand what they're, what's going on with the different resolutions of the telescope. Um, but in the, anyway, on the disco gas are doing into H plus to the uh, right here shows that early Argus data with four cores. Shea Storm did this heat well early on and then um, handed that off to um, Chi Yu Chen who wrote up results and this motivated results there where they're seeing evidence for rotation within these cores motivated their their large project on the gbt disco gas they want to look at 108 young cores um, in the perseus region they're sort of marked here in the perseus region this is a herschel image and that's what they'll target with the argus observations so they're just mapping and you, you know the three arc minute three arc minute maps are of each of these cores so um, Argus programs to date, this is a sample. It's pretty complete. I started doing this last night and, I, and then I kicked myself for starting it because I had to sort of finish it and it took a while to type this in and you probably can't read it and you don't need to read it, but it does cover a lot of areas. And I just highlighting there's lots of Argus projects that have already gotten 
data. Um, but we've only been taking data for a couple of years, basically, with the groups, 2017 through 2020. So although there's 30 programs to date, currently, we only have two refereed publications. Uh, we're hoping to get a lot more out in the coming years. I think it just takes a while for the community to get their um, uh, hands around the GBT data and, and, and fitting it into their science programs. The, the proposal demand is still quite high. We are getting five to 10 Argus proposals per semester with the typical 25% acceptance rate, which is typical for high frequency <laughs> programs on the GBT. High frequency programs on the GBT, that's where our user base is growing and it's under a high demand because you really, they're not, a, you don't have 100 meter class telescopes with this kind of sensitivity at high frequency. Um, the future, Argus itself, I should have mentioned, it was just really a prototype. It was an engineering um, proposal and grant from NSF to demonstrate that we could build these modules, pack them in, um, and we, that, that program was successful. Uh, we could potentially scale Argus up to a much larger system, and we call it Argus 144, Argus Plus. 144 is nine times 16, nine sets of Arguses effectively. And they would cover the same frequency range. And the, the idea there is you'd have this seven to nine arc second resolution with a six arc minute field of view, and you could really map larger areas, much larger than we're, even, we're doing now. I, in fact, most of our groups in star formation, they still think small. They're still mapping cores. And I think we could leverage um, even Argus, but certainly Argus 144 to map very large areas. Um, There's certain limitations on the GBT um, in the sense of and right now in terms of our LO, in terms of how fast we can map, we can only switch 0.4 seconds. And you actually get high signal noise with the GBT, like for, like you can look at 13 CO, you can make good detections of 13 CO in 0.1 seconds. <laughs> so there's like individual data samples and commissioning, which I was really surprised. It's just like these lines were just popping out, one beam, one like a tenth of a second, you have high detections. So basically, um, we could potentially map, if we could map and, and improve our LO method by basically buying another LO and a fast switch, we could um, map like 50 times the current speed with the Argus 144, the new LO. And basically these wide area mappings, we talk about a little bit in our, the 2020 white paper for the Argus Plus, we call it there. We're calling it Argus 144 in our, our recent in, uh, proposals to NSF. Um, but anyway, we argue for the wide area mapping. And this just shows an example here in the image. It shows a Herschel continuum image. And this is a combination, this is real data of Karma with the Nobiyama single dish, the, um, the 40, I guess it's 45 meters um, of Orion. And um, this is the kind of science one could do with Argus 144. We'd be able to map very large areas um, relatively quickly. And here's just a table that we have in the, the white paper or saying you could basically, if you don't go too deep for like 13 CO, you can actually map in principle a square degree every hour. So and that opens up, you know, potentially hundreds of hours, but one, um, hundreds of square degrees one can map. If you're doing N2H plus and you know, those are cold cloud cores, you tend to want to um, map at a higher spectral resolution and go deeper and then you're talking, then, then the time starts to get a little bit sig significant, but you could still map um, many, 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 many of square arc minutes to square degrees. So that's the future where we're looking at. And I will end there. And thank you. Let's see here, I'm gonna stop my share. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, let's see here, Q&A. Let's see. We're looking at the chat. No, it's still <laughs> the last think... chat was at three seventeen. There, oh, there is there still, is there is a this, question from Brian. Brian. Yeah, I see Thank a question you. From All right. Um, so Brian asked a question. I'll go ahead and 
he asked, um, Brian Mason asked a question, could it just be a scaled up Argus 144? Is, is it just basically a scaled up version of Argus or would there be significant differences? When we put in the first Argus 144 proposal to NSF, it would have been basically a scaled up version. Um, as time moves on, we'll probably, you know, have, um, it'll be slightly different, but probably the LNA. Um, the mimics design, we'd probably try to improve upon that with our JPL partners. Uh, so, and would it still be a single pole? That's an inter I would, uh, if we follow the current design, yes. If we are trying to get a, a dual polarization and uh, that'd be tougher. Now, when we first put Argus together, we talked about putting rows of polarization, one would be set one way and the next row would be set this way if it, um, and try to pack it in. But in the end, they just packed it all in the same direction. So whether we can have each feed C2 polarization, that would take some additional design work. If you look at the modules and how they're packed in there now, that might be challenging. And then when you have an OMT in there, the gains you get by having that second polarization are, are mitigated by a lot of times by the increased noise with the uh, by um, splitting out the polarizations of the OMT. So there's trade trade-offs involved there. Oh, and then, okay, Larry was gonna go offline. And okay, circular would be better for calibration. Yeah, but then you need, the feeds are natively linear. We, we like circular too for VLB observations. And um, I guess Frank will talk about that at the next session. Um, our W band receiver, they're linear polarization, dual polarization, but we put a quarter wave plate in there in the optical path to make circular polarization for it to be able to carry out VLB observations. NRAO in general likes circular polarization. They tend to be noisier. Okay, so those are the panel questions or discussions. Okay. Um, All right. So only 20 minutes after. <laughs> so thank you everybody for hanging out. Is that bad? Yeah. Yeah, we appreciate it and uh, appreciate all this good uh, talk. I'm glad to bring in things about the, the now and the future as well, because um, that's really important. So thank you, Dave, that was great. Thank you everybody else for this section. So I believe we will adjourn now and we get back together at four, is that right? Yep, Jill's nodding her head. Yes. Does anybody have any part, parting comments? Yes, or? If anyone's curious right. about the recordings, Good. we are working on these. It's time to process the videos, so we'll have those up as soon as possible. Yes, absolutely. 